for the Annenberg School for Communication, the Jeff Cowan Forum. I know this is the communication but if you all could stop communicating, thank you. I uh, want to take this opportunity to welcome uh, our guest, Linda Resnick, here today. We were having a, a very nice discussion upstairs. Um, and I was sort of bragging on the school. I said, "Well, you know, we've done all we've done all these had all these awards in, in public relations, and we're in the top five schools. And one of our students just got an award." And th then Linda mentioned, "Oh, that's all. Very, that's very interesting." But the uh, her company, the Roll uh, International, their PR team was just awarded the best in-house public relations team of the year. That was just announced, uh, beating out, by the way semi-finalists, which included McDonald's, Deloitte, and the American Red Cross. Uh, we were also chatting a bit upstairs, uh, upstairs before we came down about the importance of being able to tell a good story, of public relations, of, of being able to say clearly and consistently uh, your message. Um, and this is a story, of course, that you'll hear today from, uh, from Linda about that taking place in the private sector. But Linda is also very active in public service um, and in the public sector and has contributed a substantial amount of research to look at the health benefits for uh, various kinds of foods and juices, including pomegranate juice, which uh, you'll hear that story about today as well. Uh, so I really want to welcome her here. But before I turn the uh, mic over to her, uh, metaphorically speaking, uh, I'm going to ask another one of our colleagues to come to the podium and say a few introductory words, if you would. This is Jeff Cole. He runs the Center for the Digital Future here in Annenberg and is a good friend of Linda's who also serves on his board and one of his uh, strong supporters. So Professor Cole, so nice to see you, sir. Thank you. Well, and how nice to see you here, Linda. I, I've known Linda for quite a few years. Simply put, I don't think there's a smarter business in the political business marketing world. There isn't a smarter person who has a better, more deep understanding of how people are motivated, the kinds of things they do. Her knowledge of television, of print, and now of the internet rivals that of anyone I know at the television networks or at any of the major worldwide agencies, and I work with a couple of the biggest. Linda and her husband Stuart also have a social conscience that I think is unrivaled by anyone. I was an expert witness once in a case that Linda was involved in and uh, had an opportunity to see something that she rarely talks about, to see a little bit of the extent of her public giving, and it is absolutely staggering. Uh, I think this book, which I had the honor to be able to read in Galley about <laughs> six or eight months ago, is a fascinating combination of autobiography and how-to, and one of the things you'll see is Linda, as part of her conscience, is every product she sells is really a great product on its own, one that contributes in some important way. It's a really unique combination of products. But I think this is a real treat to have you here at the school and to learn both from your book and from you and some of the fascinating parts of your life how it's all done. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody. The slides, you think we have enough the right amount of light okay uh, it's wonderful to be here I really appreciate the invitation so much so I'm here today I'm here today to demystify marketing and the creative process and to show you how we build successful brands at the role family of companies now um, I don't know if you talk about creativity very much but it touches all of our lives and I wonder if you know what the Greeks and Romans thought about the creative process. Anybody here know? Okay, good. Well, they felt that in ancient Greece, they felt that the daemon, which was the creative spirit, was outside of the human being, okay? And Socrates believed in his daemon's voice so much uh, that uh, when his trial occurred and the daemon didn't speak to him, he assumed that death was just another part of his journey. 
Now, the uh, Romans called it genius, but it was also outside of them, and it lived in the walls of the artist's studio. And um, that was kind of a convenient construct, don't you think? So that um, if you produced an ugly picture, it wasn't really your fault. It was that your genius was a hack. <laughs> so that was the point there. But uh, during the Middle Ages, uh, they thought of this thing as a, perhaps a devil or a real demon. And often, so-called geniuses had to be exercised. And it wasn't until the Renaissance and the Reformation that people began to be referred to as being a genius rather than having a genius. So today, this is what we have to live with. <laughs> now, um, in his biography, uh, Walter uh, Isaacson, who wrote the biography of Einstein, felt that Einstein's creativity was what made the difference and not his mathematical genius. And here we have Einstein's thought. Creativity is seeing what others see and thinking what no one else has thought. Now, there are a few people that I think are geniuses, but uh, we've seen the dark side of genius on Wall Street recently, haven't we? So there Madoff is saying, my Damon made me do it. <laughs> but how does the Roll family of companies deal with creativity? Um, when I came up with this logo, how many people in the room knew about Palm before we came here today? Can I say, oh, goody. <laughs> Thank you. I don't care if you're lying or not. Um, so my husband, Stuart, is the farmer, and he's also the brains in the outfit. I'm the creative one, right, and the marketing person. And um, I was busy working on a whole bunch of other projects, and Stuart was very much into this pomegranate idea. This is way back in the very early 90s. And um, he eventually, in 2001, invited me to a meeting were some marketing folks from the outside, if you could believe that he would call anybody from the outside, in to discuss uh, how they were going to solve the marketing problem of pomegranates. And during that meeting, I wrote these, these letters on a piece of paper, and I handed it to him, and I said, here's the name of your product. And that was like divine intervention. Now I'm reading a lot of books like How We Decide and things like that, that are telling me that maybe my subconscious was talking to me. But at that moment, I felt that I, got, that I really had some life force in me. But you can't count on that. Any, well, you can count on Cher having another farewell tour. But um, you can't really count on divine intervention. So this is what I'm here to talk to you about, how we solved all these problems that I actually have a method to my madness. So here's the book, Ruby's in the Orchard, that I know you're gonna go home and read immediately. And one of the things I wanna tell you about creativity is that, and this is my quote, creativity isn't thinking outside the box, it's thinking inside the box. Now that is so different from everything you've ever heard. Um, but I believe that you need a box to solve a problem. If you, can, if you have the whole world to decide, I mean, you could go crazy. You have to look inside the problem to get the answer. So, value. That is the number one thing you need today when you're building a brand, even if the brand <coughs> is you. You need a unique selling proposition. Why are you different than everyone else? There's so many choices in this world today. Why should anybody buy what you're selling over the next guy? And transparency and community, which is the seismic shift that we are going through as we stand on the crossroads of this change in our society, which is the most exciting time in history. Well, at least in my history, which is very long, I'm afraid to tell you. Um, this is the internet age. So let's talk about value. The solution is inherent in the problem itself, and it will eventually emerge from deep exploration. 
but good marketing campaigns start with value. What is the intrinsic value in your product or service? Where does this value live? And remember, value isn't price. Because there's always someone that is willing to make less money than you are. Value has to be intrinsic. It has to be something that people need, whether they know it or not. And where does this value live? And how can you communicate it in a creative and efficient way? These basic tenets never change, never. Basic value doesn't show up like a high school friend on Facebook. You have to dig for it, like I have to dig for a compliment from my mother. <laughs> it takes intellectual curiosity and a genuine love of lifelong learning. And above all, it takes patience. Let me give you an example. In 1986, when uh, Stuart, my husband, purchased a large pistachio orchard in the San Joaquin Valley, only to discover that the land had 120 acres of these rubies. Um, the farmer said, let's pull them. Stuart said, let's see how they do. Stuart's a man of few words, not like me. Now, Stuart's a very smart guy, but he's not successful just because he's smart. He's open to new opportunities, and he knows how to be patient. So back then, pomegranates were a very small-scale commodity. In a study done in 2002, we discovered, 2002, that 4% of the population had ever tasted a pomegranate in the last year, and 12% thought they knew what a pomegranate was. <laughs> now, we're in Southern California, so we had pomegranate trees in our backyard, but the rest of the nation, they didn't know. So we decided to find out everything we could about the pomegranate. And this pomegranate is steeped in history. King Tut took a pomegranate vase into the afterlife. In ancient Greek mythology, um, you know about Persephone. She heralds spring. She's always pictured with uh, a pomegranate. She had a love affair with Hades, which is always a bad idea. And he would only let her surf, come to the surface once a year. Hippocrates and Discordes, uh, they used the pomegranate for all sorts of ailments, from easing the uh, pain of childbirth to sores, etc. And some people believe that it was a pomegranate, not the apple, in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> this child is now 17. We do crazy Christmas cards every year. <laughs> And uh, this was my husband, that's Stuart. He usually wears more clothes than that at work, and I do too. And these are uh, three of the grandchildren. We've had a fourth one since, so. Um, in medieval England, Catherine de Aragon, this was her crest. She was one of the only wives of Henry VIII that ended up with her head, which is where we got the idea of preventive medicine. And uh, Queen Isabella, that troublemaker that started the Inquisition, you know, she stood in a mountain in Andalusia and said, I'm going to take over this country, just like the pomegranate, one seed at a time. So you go to Granada, which is the Spanish word for pomegranate, and, it, and that's where she and Ferdinand are buried, and it's resplendent with pomegranate iconography everywhere. So the bottom line is this fruit had a story to tell, and its legendary health benefits were amazing. So we spent 11 years and tens of millions of dollars with universities and scientific centers like UCLA and the Cleveland Clinic and Harvard and the Mayo Clinic and so on to find out if these things were true. We did our first study with Michael Aviram in uh, Technion University in Israel and he was the guy that did the seminal work on red wine. And what he, we discovered at that point was that pomegranate juice had more polyphenol antioxidants and more antioxidants than red wine or any of these other substances. And then we began to put more and more money into the research. So this knowledge gave us the confidence to increase our planning of our little orchard of 120 acres to the 18,000 acres we have today. And over 1986 to 2009, uh, we had the patience the patience to bring this to market. And we invested $110 million before we ever saw a profit. What did we learn from this? We learned, number one, we had to make a juice. 
And we learned that it takes intellectual curiosity, lots of hard work, and patience. And if any one of these virtues hadn't been present, we wouldn't have the success that we have today. Now, one of my favorite examples of these three disciplines is right around the corner. You know it, it's the Watts Towers, uh, made by a construction worker, Simon Rodia, an Italian immigrant, with his own bare hands over 33 years. Did you know that they tried to pull it down for earthquake safety and broke the crane? Um, <coughs> he had no grand plan. He had hand tools, window washers equipment, and millions of pieces of found material. And he built the Watts Towers, which today is a, a, a park. That's why I built the towers, where I quit the drinking. A simple reason. <coughs> The second component is the unique selling proposition, the USP, one of the great cornerstones of marketing. Start, the idea came up in 1940 by Mr. Rosser, who worked for Ted Bates, but it's as important today as it was then. Being a good marketer is like being a good friend. If you listen, you have empathy, and you care, you will do better. It's that kind of empathy that allows you to create a trust with your consumer. And they instinctively know if it's sincere. You know when you hear something if it's real and if it isn't. Your gut tells you. So how do you build a unique selling proposition? Well, first of all, it's got to be true. It's got to be clear. It's got to be easy to understand. And it has to have a unique quality that the need in the marketplace needs, whether they know it or not. Here's a few you recognize. Your calling is calling. Hopes and dreams of millions of job seekers summed up in that little logo. If you don't feel like a champion when you eat your Wheaties in the morning, they've missed the boat. It must be working. It's been around for a long time. And Taco Bell thinking outside the box, or inside the box, came up with thinking in, outside the bun. So we put a lot of thought into the taglines that we use and the unique selling proposition that we use at our family of companies. The antioxidant superpower is the unique selling proposition of Palm. It's not a juice, it's health in the bottle. It's backed with $30 million of peer-reviewed peer science, and that's why that works. This is a cartoon of an aquifer. In Fiji, which is one of the most pristine places on the planet, our water fell as rain over 200 years ago into this volcanic rock where it's protected. And it isn't until we put the borehole in and put the water through medically sealed pipes right into the bottle that you get untouched by man until you drink it. That's the difference. So how do we arrive at these USPs? And how do you create something that's virtually synonymous with your brand? Often it isn't that they can't see the solution, it's that they can't see the problem. Our first campaign for Teleflora is a textbook case for this idea. We bought Teleflora over 30 years ago. It was a 98 pound weekly, weekly next to FTD. Do you know what Teleflora is or FTD? Flower by Wire Company? That's what it is. So we make sure that when you send flowers to your mother, which I hope you will, for Mother's Day, and you order them, that uh, if she lives out of state or out of town, we guarantee that the florist that you went to to send the order, or the internet service, will pay the people that fill the order. We're a clearinghouse. So when we started this business, or when we bought this little business 30 years ago, we were tiny compared to FTD. FTD was like five times our size. And to make matters worse, FTD was owned and operated by the florists. So how are you going to motivate these gatekeepers to send the flowers through the competition? Well, the first thing we did when we bought the company, we looked like real geniuses because we, incre we increased the dues that the florists paid and increased our profits 1200 percent. We look like geniuses except for one thing. When you do that, you have to deliver more value. And we did that too. We needed a USP. And how do you do that in a recession economy, which is what we were in, a serious recession in 1980, and with a product that dies? 
within a week or so. So the question was, how do you add value? This is what we did. We designed flowers in a gift. So when the flowers died, the gift would remind the recipient forever of the emotion with which the flowers were sent. And um, we, we were charging approximately the same amount of money for the little watering cans and so forth as the competition did for their floral arrangements. How did we do this? In those days, we, went, we were some of the first people to go to the Far East, open factories, low-cost factories, and teach the people there how to do it. This idea was so big, we won the gold effie for it. Now that's a unique selling proposition. But times changed. How is the floral industry today? Well, we are the industry leader 30 years later. We're twice as big as FTD. And FTD went the way of Wall Street. They sold their co-op to a Wall Street firm that turned around and fired all of them and shut down their corporate headquarters and then proceeded to destroy the brand. I mean, thank you, but, you know, it was unfortunate. Today, 60% of the flowers that you order online come in a box. And if you're about six hours late or three hours late coming home, that box is sitting on the doorstep in the hot sun, and um, it's like, well, Jeannie, it's your birthday. We're going to have the most romantic dinner. There's only one thing you have to cook it yourself. Because you have to arrange the flowers, and half the time they don't even come with a vase. So our unique selling proposition has shifted a little bit. Does anybody remember seeing our Super Bowl spot? Good. We have one. Um, well, millions of people saw it. And um, it talks about the unique selling proposition of Teleflower because our flowers are designed and delivered by any one of our 20,000 florists around the country directly to your doorstep, and this guy comes with it. <laughs> He's adorable. So to support our 20,000 florists this Valentine's Day, for the first time in history, we bought a Super Bowl spot. A Super Bowl spot is $3 million, but you don't just buy a Super Bowl spot because it's over in 30 seconds. So what you have to do is you have to buy support around it. So we were online, we, we fed that wonderful spot to YouTube and every place on the planet. We bought uh, screens or, or skins around uh, the Channel 4, their um, website and so forth. So we just spread that message everywhere. And the click-throughs to our spot were amazing. And many of the magazines and newspapers that reported on the Super Bowl gave us, like, number one or number two spot. We were always in the top five everywhere, which is, for the first time in history, to do a Super Bowl spot that was designed and developed by our in-house team, because we do everything in-house, uh, was quite a coup. So let me show it to you. Hey, Diane, these flowers came for you. Ooh, oh, flowers for Diane. I never get flowers. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Look at the mug on you. Diane, you're a train wreck. That's why he only sent a box of flowers. Go home to your romance novels and your fat, smelly cat. This Valentine's Day, don't send flowers in a box. You never know what they'll say. No one wants to see you naked. Teleflora's bouquets are hand-arranged, hand-delivered, and a keepsake vase, not in a box. That's the Teleflora difference. I'd like to Gary? see... <laughs> Don't send flowers in a box. You never know what they'll say. Um, our sales are, were up 28% for Valentine's Day in an industry that's 15% down. And that momentum has lasted us. For this Easter, we're up, I don't know, 15%, which is unbelievable. I mean, it was the smartest thing we ever did. And it was kind of a mistake because we were drunk when we made the decision. <laughs> Every other year, Stuart uh, and I take the key management off-site to Europe or Asia or someplace to have a brainstorming session. And um, we were in Barcelona in May. It was divine. And we had rented out the Picasso Museum for a dinner. And we were all sitting under the balcony there. I mean, it was, uh, 
the wine was flowing, we were eating well, the guitars were playing, and our new CFO raised his hand and he said, I have something to say. I just saw the Teleflower presentation and I think our difference is so outstanding, we should do a Super Bowl spot. And we all said, great. And then we bought it. And then the bottom fell out of everything. Uh, and I don't know, to tell you the truth, if I could have called it back, if I would have, and thank God I couldn't, because what happened was fabulous. So, the last of the three components is transparency and community, something that the PR people in this room really care about. Um, it's a seismic shift in the way businesses are now being viewed and evaluated by consumers. It used to be said that honesty was the best policy. Well, you know. With Google and Facebook and Twitter and Technorati spreading the information to millions of people like wildfire, honesty is the only policy. With a click of a mouse, today's consumer can determine if you run an honest shop, what your carbon footprint is, if you're a cheat or you're a good guy. Take the case of Pizza Hut. Jessica Simpson was hired as their spokesperson and the blogosphere got a hold of the reports that pizza actually makes the poor girl sick. It turns out that she's allergic to bread, cheese, and believe it or not, tomatoes. Now, this didn't destroy Pizza Hut, but it kind of damaged their credibility. Doing well by doing good. Community is the heart of the web. Many companies are adopting new policies and models that merge business with the environment and philanthropy. For every pair of Tom's shoes that you buy, have you ever heard of Tom's shoes? These little espadrilles, for every pair that you buy, um, they will buy a pair of shoes for a child in a third world country, and they really do it. And go to their website and see what it's like. I mean, there'll be tears running down your face. It, it is so inspiring. Project Red for AIDS in Africa brought everyone together, apples and, Apple and Windows and everyone on the planet working toward this wonderful cause. <coughs> Fiji Green. So I was at the Aspen Institute a few years ago when a young man who worked for Google was very proud about a blog that he had done showing a bottle of Fiji water three quarters full of crude oil. Now, I knew that it didn't take that much crude oil to get a bottle of Fiji into your hands at your local supermarket or 7-Eleven, but I didn't know how much it actually did take, and I had to find out very quickly. So I had my in-house consulting team work on a project, and I found out that it's a tablespoon of oil, but that's still too much. So what did we do? You know, I didn't have to wait too long, corporately we didn't have to wait too long, for this to resonate with us, because Stuart and I have been part of Conservation International for 14 years. It's one of the most important issues in our lives. And yes, we're in the water business, but how can we make it palatable, okay, in truth? So we reduced our carbon footprint by 25%. We reduced the plastics in our packaging. We bought back the remaining emissions offsets by 120% so that we are not carbon neutral, we're carbon negative. Every time you pick up a bottle of Fiji and drink it, you're giving 20% back to the grid. And uh, we saved the Sovi Basin, uh, 50,000 square uh, acres, yeah, of the most pristine rainforest where 34 uh, plants and animals that don't exist anywhere else on the planet are now saved. That did not go to our carbon offsets. What we do with our carbon offsets is we replant rainforest in Fiji that's been decimated by the Malaysian and Chinese loggers and uh, the sugarcane uh, plantation. We, build, uh, we create mango groves to, uh, for a new industry for the people there. But the other thing that we do is we're 3% of the Fijian GDP, which is the same as Walmart is in America. That's how big we are there. And we build the infrastructure. We bring education to the villages. We bring fresh water to the villages. If we left, it would decimate their economy. They have a 
a rogue government that changes every five years with a new coup. They don't have any guns. They have 14 guns on all the, pl uh, all the uh, different islands, but they still manage to have these coups all the time. And so sometimes it's very hard to be in Fiji, but we do it because it's good for the Fijians and people love the water, so there you have it. Our project keeps 10 million tons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. You know that the worst thing that you can do ever is cut down a tree because all the carbon that that tree has brought in during its lifetime is suddenly released. So there you have it. What tribe are you? Tribes? Trojan. Exactly. <laughs> all right. For all the dangers of the internet, it is a gold mine of opportunities. And for the first time since Julius Caesar walked in the farm, Forum of Rome and talked to the entire population, and they talked back except for the women and slaves, of course, uh, governments and corporations are not just talking at people, they're talking with people. And this is the seismic change. We all have a voice. Uh, even the smallest companies can take advantage of this opening. There are no longer barriers to entry. Anybody um, follow the Kogi truck? You can find them on Twitter. They're, they're huge, okay? $2 tacos, they're supposed to be delicious. And their whole marketing plan is to go on Twitter where they're going to be that day. And you can see hundreds of people lining up to get their uh, taco. That's a small scale example. What's the biggest example? This is the biggest example. This is the change. Why was this man elected? I believe he was elected because he changed the paradigm. It's no longer a bunch of gray-haired guys in a room deciding our future. It's no longer a top-down idea. Now, I love gray-haired guys, <laughs> but uh, I don't want you to think I have anything against them. Uh, so there you have it. But now it's a top-up. We all have a voice. Because of the combination of recent technological advancements and economic setbacks, society has changed markedly. What does this new society look for? And what do they want companies to provide? I tell my coworkers that since October, it's as though we've landed on Mars. And how do we communicate with these new Martians? People are different than they were before the recession. And they're going through the seven stages of grief, I believe. And when you saw how angry they were with AIG, that was the hysterical mad stage. And now they're sort of depressed because that's what comes next. But when they wake up, we're going to show them what they should be doing. <laughs> the advent of blogs and Google Alerts have made these questions easier to answer. And we all have the tools now to find our virtual tribes and talk to them. In early January, Tropicana changed their juice box. And what happened? Their sales went down and the blogosphere went crazy. Why? This is the last time people were happy when mommy was serving them this. All of a sudden, we took away their security blanket. And as one fan said, Another case of not realizing brands belong to the people who buy them, not the people who make them. And isn't it the truth? And what's the lesson? Creativity for creativity's sake. You don't, if the goose is laying a golden egg, you don't try to make it platinum. Then you end up with one, uh, you know, you kill the goose and you end up with one serving of foie gras. That's no good. <laughs> we reach out to our fans on Facebook and in the blogosphere. Um, we give them insider rewards, we let them know that they are our ambassadors and that we need their loyalty and trust their loyalty. Creativity is alive. Hard work is back. And no longer instant gratification. That's what got us into this whole heap of trouble to begin with. We want it and we want it now. And we're going to buy it whether we can afford it or not. And that has to stop. It was terribly short-sighted. But trust me, I've lived through many recessions. I've lived through bubbles and bursts, and you will survive. Outliers. How many people have read this? 
I just think it's brilliant, even though I was very depressed when I read it. Uh, because of the 10,000 hours it takes to be a Bill Gates or a hockey player, because this is really my desire, is to be a hockey player for um, a, a Canadian team. But whether you want to play with the Trojans or whatever, you need your 10,000 hours of hard work. So I've learned a lot over the past 40 years that I've been in business, and most of my lessons are in the rubies in the orchard that you'll read. And I hope that you find it a compelling roadmap for how to conduct your future in this new century. But don't despair. Big is no longer best anymore. All you have to do is look at your parents' 401k to see what's happened to the big companies that we all invested in for our future. The little companies have an opening now. It's a time for all kinds of disruptive technology in every form to emerge, really. So many companies started during recessions like Coors Beer and IBM and UPS and HP and Super 8, all during crises that you would think were crazy to start a business. The History Channel could spawn a new series just based on this. Now we're on equal footing with these giant companies, but we don't have the debt and we don't have the huge overhead, which makes us so much more nimble. So here you are in the mall of the future. <laughs> That's you. What are you going to do? There's no silver bullet, of course. But if you're prepared to stay positive and focused, to think inside the box, to dethrone the tyranny of instant gratification, to work harder and smarter than ever before, you will find success, whatever your definition of success is. And it doesn't matter if your creativity or inspiration lives in your floorboards or in your frontal lobe, really. Inspiration does exist, but when it shows up, it better find you working. That's what Mr. Picasso said. Thank you. No, 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 I'm fine. I'm good. I do have to say that uh, here at the Annenberg School, we've been trying to sort of reimagine a little bit who we are, what does it mean to, to educate the next generation of communicators, the people in public relations and journalism. And uh, I think um, as soon as I can squeeze onto our speaker's schedule, I would like to go talk to her about how we can better reimagine the Annenberg School for Communication. Maybe starting with that Picasso Museum idea. Or at least go to the local. Uh, That's how we went on. <laughs> okay. But let's open it up for questions. And please identify yourself. Roger. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Michelle. I'm actually a senior student here. Um, I was just wondering, as such a successful entrepreneur, obviously you have some great advice for us. But is there anything that you really like find to be your best piece of advice for aspiring entrepreneurs? You know, that whole idea of being an entrepreneur, what, what does it mean? It means you don't share the fear that the majority of the population does. Um, and even if you have the fear, believe me, I fear. When uh, I took over the palm business, um, my COO used to sit in his office doing computer models of why we were going to fail. All day long, I thought, you know, let's work a little here, you know. Stop being so negative. I was terrified, but I believed that it would work. And you will make mistakes, but do not fear your mistakes, because I promise you, you will learn so much more from your mistakes than you ever will from your successes. The success you never know. I mean, there's so many reasons that it could have happened, but when you fail, boy, it is clear. <laughs> so, uh, that's my best advice. Yes. Thank you. My name is Rick. Um, I know there are a lot of different schools of thought nowadays and theories about what creativity is and how you foster, but I think what I've kind of discovered is that you just kind of 
just like life kind of happens, you just kind of get inspired. But other things that you do in your everyday life that kind of let the news talk to you more often, or let the day come in a little more often. Well, what I do is, uh, you know, I go to TED, okay, and, and uh, you, anybody know what the TED conference is? What? Oh, uh, how do we promote creativity? How, uh, how do you keep the creative juices flowing? What, what do you do? So what I do is try to get out of my life into other lives and, you know, go to the TED conference, go to the Aspen Institute, read everything I can get my hands on. I mean, I'm a student of life. As we age, our blinders close and I spend a lot of time trying to keep them open. When, when the internet was born, I was a grandma in cyberspace immediately, you know. Someone told me very good piece of advice. You cannot break your computer. <laughs> Once you learn that and People say, but I don't know how it works. I don't know how my toaster works either. That doesn't mean I'm not going to use it. You know, these were things that helped me along. So it's just being out there, you know, that's what works. Yes. Yes, uh, Christina Jordan in Holmes Media and alum, class of 88. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, <laughs> um, I was wondering how you're using uh, mobile phone technology to split your marketing, direct marketing model. Yeah, uh, well, in America, the mobile phone technology isn't as advanced as it is, obviously, everywhere else on the planet. Uh, so we have done some tests, and they've been pretty good, and we are continuing to try. I do believe it's the future. I mean, my God, we're going to, you know, read our newspapers on our telephones. We're, uh, are they telephones? There are more cameras in phones than there are outside of phones. There are more movie cameras than there are outside of phones. I mean, in phones than there are. So it's the future for sure. Yes. You said that a lot of marketing you guys do are web 2.0 based, a lot of blogs, Twitter, you know. Um, what do you see the future of the marketing, like what platform you need to use? I've been asked what the platform, new platforms are going to be. I have no idea. Talk to Eric Schmidt. Uh, he's the guy that runs Google. I, I don't know what's coming down. I mean, I hear, you know, and I wish and I pray for all these new platforms to emerge. I, I don't, I'm not a technological uh, wizard in any way, shape, or form, and I just go with the flow. But when it comes out, you, I can promise you, we'll be there. <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, Wong from Antwerp. Uh, I'm curious about your brand portfolio strategy. You have these you know, three or four mega brands. And how do you go about, you know, going forward, focusing on the product brands or kind of overall kind of a, you know, lifestyle approach and, and then use the brands to express that? Jay's one of our professors. Oh, here. lovely. I, I, I wish I could give you some fabulous answer, you know, about how we planned all this and worked it out. But actually, it isn't a grand plan at all. The one thing is that we will not go into a business that will harm in any way. And hopefully, I mean, I believe, and you'll read it in the book in the last chapter, which is a little heavy, that unless you're giving back with everything you do, that there is no place for you in the new society. You don't belong here. And so we support the Central Valley uh, tremendously, which is where our crops are grown. Uh, you know, we're known for Fiji and Palm, but we really make our money as, uh, in farming. I mean, we are the uh, largest farmers of tree crops probably in the world. 210 square miles of trees that grow pomegranates, pistachios. You want to talk about a PR nightmare? Um, and, uh, and cuties, those little clementines, and palm, you know, palm. And so uh, that's what we do. And, and my job is to brand those commodities and, and so forth. And so, you know, it just sort of happened. My husband is a genius at seeing, uh, looking at a balance uh, sheet and knowing where they've missed the opportunity. And then he buys the company and he says, all right, you take it over, you know, you do, you, you do the advertising, now you do the marketing, you make people want to buy it. And so that's how we work. We have separate, uh, you know, talents. We're like salt and pepper shakers. <laughs> Yes. Hi, Linda. First, I'm Jerry Swirling. I'm on the PR faculty here. And first, I want to thank you for a terrific presentation. Thank you. Really great. Um, you're obviously doing a huge amount of PR of CSR. Can you 
Corporate Social At CEO? CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. Oh, yes, yes. And um, there are lots of different schools of thought about what, mo mo what motivates organizations to practice CSR. Some say if it doesn't have a business benefit and you can't see the result at the bottom line, why are you doing it? And others say there are reasons to go beyond profitability and, and market share. What's your view? Well, you know, Stuart and I are no spring chickens. I have five children. Four of them are in relationships or married, and I have four grandchildren. One of them 17. So we've been around for a while. And uh, we don't need to work anymore, but we do. We work because I guess we never developed any inner resources. But um, <laughs> we work to give back. That's why we work. And no, none of these things show up on your balance sheet, but how can you live with yourself? You know, we give every employee at the Roll family of companies $1,000 a year to give to any 501c3 that they see fit. And uh, then we match funds up to $5,000. So we give away about $5 million a year that way, which is fabulous. But you'd be surprised how many people don't use their money. It's crazy. Now we're going to be building a house with Habitat for Humanity very soon. Um, what we do in the Central Valley is unbelievable. We don't talk about it a lot, but we do it because these are our employees and these are the forgotten people. And um, if we didn't build the schools and we, we just built a preschool that's LEED certified platinum, we just uh, made a deal with Bard to build a new charter high school. Uh, we even are building a movie theater or renovating a movie theater that was out of business. You know, uh, we put reading into the classrooms. Um, you just scholarships for every employee's child that makes it over a 2.8 average. Yeah, this stuff costs money, but God, I mean, the rewards. Why did I write the book? I wrote the book to share every single secret I know with everyone that cares to listen, because that's what I have to do now. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Sure. Do you, I would imagine at some point you thought about going public or, or something like that. <laughs> Everybody Never. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you think that this could still be true if you were a publicly traded company? Well, it would be a lot harder. Um, look what happened to corporate America, this instant gratification thing I was talking about. Every company was run for quarterly earnings. It was crazy. Not for the long haul. So we would never be public, but hopefully corporate America will get a conscience now because look where it's gotten them. We have to have a long view. I mean, I see op-ed pieces coming out all the time now about the long view, the long view, which is something that people didn't talk about before. So I'm hopeful. Yes, sir. <coughs> Robert Shear, I've known you for years. And you have a social conscience as a young, as a young person. Oh, well, you need to bring that no. up. Because <laughs> <laughs> I knew you before you were wealthy. <laughs> and uh, you, no, you really did a very brave thing, and you cared about the society long before these products. So why don't you just mention it? I mean, uh, they don't even know what I'm talking about. Anybody here ever hear of the Pentagon Papers? Yes. Okay. So I was on trial with Daniel Ellsberg because I Xeroxed the Pentagon Papers on the Xerox machine in my advertising agency when I was a kid. And uh, I never appeared in public after that. <laughs> Two years of my life were destroyed by this thing, and yes, we did change the history books. It's a wonderful thing that happened, but it was very scary, and um, I kind of emerged a few years ago with a profile on me, and uh, The New Yorker was the first time anybody knew I existed. I was like behind the scenes. So very big in PR for our companies, but not for me personally, because... I had been burned. When you've been on the front page of every newspaper in America as a, some sort of a horrible villain, you kind of shy away from PR. But, um, you know, I've gotten over it. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? I have one question I'd like to ask you. you, you I think one of the big points that you talked about was communication. And I wonder if you could say, or share your thoughts a little bit, especially with this audience, about what you mean by the term communication? What, how does that fit into your thinking? Yeah, well, we really are everywhere. We're, we're Twittering, we're blogging, we're message boarding. We um, get the Google alerts and the Technorati alerts about anywhere <laughs> on the planet that our brands are being discussed, and we get into the conversation. 
we've had some pretty horrible PR nightmares. And um, let me tell you about PETA. Okay. So the PETA people decided that we were bad because in order for us to do our medical research, first you do the work in the test tube and then you test on animals and then you go to humans. It's just the protocol. And we did some testing on our juice on rats and um, mice and one rabbit study, but they were happy because that was because we were testing the Viagra quality of palm juice, which is 40% as effective as Viagra. So the rabbits had no complaints. <laughs> anyway, but, but the, uh, the mice and, and, and the rats did. And for eight months, we were hounded by PETA and then by um, the animal activist people. And what they did is they camped outside of our houses in the dead of night, screaming horrible words with foghorns into the neighborhoods. Uh, they whispered into the windows of the children's sleep, you know, bedrooms, saying that, you know, we're going to get you. They uh, had bomb threats at our headquarters. They went, went, like, at our company picnic and destroyed the day for everybody. And then they eventually um, uh, threatened that they had... Uh, put poison in 500 bottles of juice on the eastern seaboard, but they weren't going to say where, and so people were pouring out our juice on the sidewalk. And my husband had handled this uh, up until then, and um, he said, we're going to do this. I, I don't negotiate with terrorists. Okay, John Wayne. I married John Wayne. <laughs> so... Um, uh, what we did, so we were doing it in the courts. We were negotiating it, you know, legally. Well, that got us nowhere. I mean, you, if you ever had a lawsuit, you know it goes on for a millennium. It's, it's like Bleak House, you know. So um, one day I came into the office and my people at Palm were like, I, I mean, they really looked like life was over. And they were second guessing everything they were doing. I said, that's it. I'm taking over this. You can divorce me. It's my job. I'm in charge of communications here. I'm going to take it over. And Matt, the president of Palm and I, uh, for two days we never slept. All we did was write our communication. And we told the truth. We hadn't done animal testing for six months and we had no uh, desire or plans to do animal testing from then on. So why couldn't we admit it? We went to our retailers, we posted it on the internet, we went to every blog. It was, the animal activists backed off that afternoon. PETA wanted us to sign a contract, we refused to do it. We said, this is the truth. If you don't like it, too bad. Within two days, PETA had pulled back. It was over. Now we work with PETA. We are uh, investing money in alternative ways. Look, I have little dogs. I love little animals. I mean, the things they said about us that we garroted dogs' bodies, we, we never did anything like that. I couldn't live with myself. But even rats have mommy rats and baby rats, right? So... Um, that's what we did, and this is what communication means today. It means you have to be honest. Now, if you have a lousy company and you treat your employees terribly and, you know, you don't have anything positive to say, then you can't. But if you are a good kid mm -hmm. and you do the right thing, you've got to get that out there because people care today. And so we're in every discussion we can be in. It was a valuable lesson. See, you learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. Well, let's give Linda Redford a very good Okay, I'm going to sign some books with my withered hand after. Um, if anybody wants to have their books signed, I'll be here. <laughs>